All right, welcome everybody. It is Thursday, uh, the 21st of February, 2019. Uh, this is the Kubernetes SIG Architecture Group. Um, and uh, I'm Jace singer Dumars, your host. Uh, and I'm Roger Kugel, and your other esteemed uh, chairs are here, uh, Brian Grant and Matt Farina. Um, we're gonna go ahead and kick off a slightly different SIG Architecture meeting this time. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, I'm going to go ahead and present a deck, um, and we'll get started there. Uh, before I do, I do want to um, ask a favor of the community as we go through this. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty lighthearted most of the time, but this is something I'm really serious about, and, and I'd love to, to sort of preserve questions until the end, and I kind of get through the, this, this presentation just so that we can sort of concentrate our discussion and not have it be um, you know, sort of spread out. So if you could all do me that favor, that would be super helpful and kind. Um, so let me see if I can manage to share uh, this deck here. Uh, okay, share. Um, actually, one, before I do that, let me um, hand off co-host to Matt for you now. So that any trolls show up? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and present. Tell me if you all can see this. Does that work? Hey. We see it. Um, okay. So uh, can we move that possibly? Um, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I, this has a very ostentatious title, uh, Re-envisioning SIG Architecture, Sustainability, Effectiveness, and Aligning with Project Values. Um, behind that title is really um, sort of a growing level of concern amongst myself and a lot of people that I've talked to uh, informally and formally over the last several weeks about what we see as sort of an increasing level of uh, frustration and burnout amongst um, our, our top contributors, just because there is, uh, seems to be an endless well of things that need to be done and uh, a, a not seemingly endless well of people to, to do those things. Um, and if you've been on these calls with SIG Architecture over the past year, um, year and a half, um, a rallying cry that I have often made is just to, uh, to try and uh, get people to step up and, and volunteer for various things, ranging from note taking duty, which uh, has anybody volunteered to take notes yet? If so, um, please hop in the doc and do that. Um, to, wow, we really need to add more API uh, reviewers and approvers, and we also need to um, staff out some of the other uh, sub-projects that we have, like the code organization. Um, so, so this led to a series of discussions with uh, people all over the community and, and trying to think about what, what can we as a group do to become more effective, to become more useful to the community, to really to do uh, what we are tasked to do by our, our charter. So um, let's talk about that for a second. Um, so our charter is this, really. Um, at the end of the day, we're, we're supposed to maintain and evolve the design principles of Kubernetes as a group. And in order to do that, we really need a consistent body of expertise uh, to ensure architectural consistency over time. So with those two things, there's a lot embedded in that. It's a short sentence with a lot of meaning. And so we have to maintain, which has a lot of implications, and then there's also the people to do it. So when you look at this, uh, it sort of breaks out, uh, assuming that my keyboard works. Oh boy, I'm playing this here. Okay, so this is sort of the, the what <clears throat> of what we do. And this is really, uh, this is really our subprojects for the most part. And, when we look at how this happens, uh, this is the people part. Uh, people have to do things to make these things work. So uh, one of the main things we do for architecture and API governance is API approvers have to review API changes. There's also a huge body of uh, documentation about how, um, how we do APIs in Kubernetes and the way we maintain those over time and deprecate and version and all that good stuff. Um, there's a lot there and it's a lot of work. Um, same with conformance definitions in the sense that that's the, the proxy for what Kubernetes is. It helps us uh, ensure that when you say you have a Kubernetes, it's uh, consistent across all implementations. Um, 
So that has uh, implications in terms of writing tests, in terms of looking at the testing structure, a whole bunch of work. Um, code organization, same thing. Uh, how do we deal with uh, vendoring and all, all manner of uh, things and staging and all that good stuff. So there's, there's a ton of things here. Um, and so what I, I did was I went and looked at who's, who's actually doing this work. Um, and I came up with anonymized colored dots to represent people who are doing this work. I want you to notice two things about this. Um, one is there are not very many dots. Um, two is that there are frequent appearances of certain uh, colors of dots across these various things. What that means is that you have one person trying to do a lot of work in a lot of different areas, um, which is, as we know, um, is incredibly hard in terms of context switching and uh, all the things that you have to do to, to be effective, especially in deep technical work. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to concentration or actually getting anything done. So uh, this is a big problem. Um, you'll also notice uh, it looks like there are dots missing. Um, I think I have an old version of this deck for some reason. That's right. Um, uh, so when we move forward in the, in the, the thing here, um, we look at these people and we notice that there are really only nine people spread across all these sub-projects. Sub when I say nine people, that, that's people who are committed in owner's files to actually work on these things. And when you get down to it, uh, the people who actually are spending a lot of time on this is uh, significantly less than that nine. Um, and so we talk about burnout and we talk about uh, uh, you know, people getting tired of, of you know, doing the same thing over and over again and not having backups or people to, to pass the work on to. This is really the heart of that. Um, and mind you that the people who are these colored uh, circles here are also leaders in other areas of the projects, other SIGs, other working groups. Uh, this is probably in some cases only some partial uh, view of what they're doing. For example, one of those, uh, one of those dots uh, is also a release lead this time. Uh, so there's a lot of work there. Um, so in, in, a, in, in short, really our mission as a, a SIG is at risk. Uh, we have the centralized reliance on a few contributors that are really reaching burnout. Uh, we don't have a succession plan and we don't really have people queued up and lining up to become the replacements for the people who are getting burned out. And last, uh, we have this problem with decision making and, uh, and what happens is that things just sort of default to sitting and languishing. And that's a really bad contributor experience, and it's a bad and demotivating experience for people who might have spent a lot of time doing a review on something, and it gets stale, and then that work is lost. So having really quick turnaround on these things is really good for everyone involved. And uh, so you can see that some of these forces are at, sort of at odds with one another. Um, and sadly, our meetings are not helping this. Um, uh, it really feels like our meetings uh, have a lot of different formats, but this sort of uniform outcome is that not a lot of things happen that actually result in work getting done. Um, and I think that part of that comes from the fact that we're just, a meeting is not a good place to make decisions for as a general rule, um, especially as a community meeting, because for one, uh, this meeting is at a terrible time for people in other time zones. It's hard to get people with diverse perspectives to be able to communicate in a way that uh, it works toward their favor. So. If you're a quiet person in the room, you may not necessarily have the mic at a specific time you need it. Or you might not be the person that has, uh, or you might not be hearing from the person that has the most experience uh, or relevant viewpoint. Um, it doesn't really give an opportunity for people to reflect and consider. So for me personally in a meeting, I, I like to think about things and when a meeting is happening, I find myself so focused on the discussion that I'm not able to really reflect on what I want to say. And by the time I do, sometimes it's the moment has passed. Um, we rarely have proper representation for all stakeholders. Again, it's really hard to get the people in a room when they're all overcommitted in other places. And lastly, roles of attendees is sometimes confusing. So somebody could, uh, could wax poetic about uh, the in intricacies of an API, but they're not necessarily an improver. So it's an important piece of information to have that viewpoint, but it may not necessarily solve the, the decision or, or finalize it. So again, knowing what anybody's role is is super important. And lastly, I think that really the discussions require context and structure. And 
one of the things I've seen is things come to this uh, to this meeting and sort of get worked out in real time. And that's not really effective because there's probably a lot of those things that could have been uh, deduped or worked out ahead of time on the mailing list. And it just happened to wind up in our, in our uh, agenda. So one of the ways to deal with that is to have more thorough discussion uh, before things are brought to the SIG and to have the, the well-defined context that ask so that we're being very actionable in the things that we talk about when possible. I have a little quip here on the right, talks about how senior managers uh, say that meetings keep them from uh, completing their own work and unproductive and efficient. All these, uh, all these statistics, I feel resonate very strongly with leaders in our community that were tasked with a lot of meetings and also getting a lot of things done. So they're very disempowering if they're not um, happening in the right way. So I've said a lot of problems, and I'm sorry, I, I know that it's easy to harp on things that are wrong, um, but I think that we have some really powerful compass points here that are actually in our project values. And if you haven't looked at our project values, um, I highly encourage you to do that. It's something that it really spells out in clear, uh, clear terms what it is that we're striving as a community to hold true. And these are a few of those, and I think that they're really appropriate to our mission and architecture. And so distribution obviously is better than centralization because when you have centralization, it, it focuses all the effort in one place. And so that becomes a bottleneck, it burns people out, it's destructive to people's uh, work-life balance. Um, I heard somebody refer to Kubernetes as literally their fifth child. Uh, that's not a good pattern. So we need to uh, spread that out. Um, being inclusive is really good. And this is a little tricky because Inclusive doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is making the decision together. It's not a decision by committee. It's really about making sure that everybody feels like they are supported in the right way by the right people at the right time. And so that opens the door for all sorts of people to be in, in, in various roles. We want to cultivate uh, leadership across the org. If you're a leader in the community, you should be thinking about who is going to replace you. And that really gets into evolution. We need to constantly be innovating and not sticking to the same uh, failing formulas. Uh, and we've been, this SIG was founded in 2017 at the, the Leadership Summit. Um, and at that time, uh, everybody in the room had a lot of concerns about the sustainability of this project. And this SIG was developed to sort of get a handle on what are the sort of long-term things that we need to keep an eye on so that they don't get out of control. Um, and this meeting really has retained the same format almost since that first day. So this conversation, this presentation, my, my feelings on this are hopefully a, a recognition that evolution in this meeting is also important. Revolution in this SIG is important. We need to, uh, to move forward. So when we get into some of these values, um, uh, sorry to be monologuing so, here, so long here too, and I'll, I'll wrap up soon. Um, but I want to talk about distribution and how we get the works split out. Uh, right now, we're sort of acting as a sort of centralized uh, gatekeeping entity, and um, that's really not an effective way to scale. Uh, we have a variety of amazing SIGs, and these SIGs have subject matter experts that are in many cases uh, well-equipped to make decisions with a, a minimal amount of guidance. And we've seen some of the most successful moments here with SIGs come to have those discussions and have our API approvers and reviewers. Uh, help guide them in the right direction. Um, and so what we want to do is really focus on providing documented and recorded guidance. Because guidance and documentation scale, humans don't. And so the more we can provide uh, things that somebody can look at at 3 o'clock in the morning in whatever time zone they're at and, uns and unstick themselves or unblock, that is really where we're doing our job. Um, and that work is really defining standards and structure and processes and enabling SIGs and, and those sub-projects and those SIGs um, to function more independently. And our sub-projects uh, within SIG architecture, our federated sub-projects, should help enable those. That should be a core mission of all of our sub-projects, actually. So then in this uh, format, what we want to do is limit discussion to really managing and scaling those processes um, of our particular sub-projects and not necessarily the outcomes or details of specific actions. So what I say that is really um, that we really need to focus on um, 
scaling everything that everyone in this room does, every one of those colored circles out to at least two or three people. And those can be people in SIGs, those can be people in the process, and so forth. And lastly, um, this meeting, us getting together, should be more of a focus on reporting important information to the community. This is our ability to radiate all the great work and all the things that are happening in our sub-projects. And also when something changes that is architectural, if, you know, if there's an API change that isn't important to the rest of the community about the sort of, you know, calling it case law about how we want to do things in the future, this is the place where somebody could go and get more information about that and ask the subject matter experts and the approvers. Um, inclusive community leadership is really, um, earned through effort, scope, quality, quantity, and duration of contributions. This is really, the, this architecture SIG is, is really a, con a concentration of people who have a ton of uh, project history, project contributions, a uh, wide variety of knowledge. And so what we wanna really do is, is look at and focus on technological and uh, project history expertise and the ability to really have a, a record of sound decision making in the project to help guide your, your leadership. And this is something that's open to everybody over time, um, but it's really a process and it takes a long time for people to, to get through this process because essentially when you start getting into the, the decision making, you have to have the respect of the community, you have to have the respect of your fellow uh, owners, and it's really about becoming a, a subject matter expert in, in the project to be able to, to reach that point. And so, it's important when you're in those roles to, to make it clear that when you're giving feedback, if it's binding or not binding. So for example, if an API approver says something about an API review, that could be a binding opinion versus somebody who is really just participating or, or watching, they could say, I think this, but it's not necessarily a binding um, decision. So when we're talking about things, it's important to keep uh, people's roles clear so that we're not confusing uh, folks in discussions. Uh, mailing list is a great place to have inclusive discussions because it doesn't uh, have to adhere to time constraints. It's not, um, it's not necessarily uh, real time, so it helps people uh, contribute when it's most convenient and appropriate for them. And lastly, uh, a big part of our, our job is to radiate this information back to other non-attending stakeholders and decision makers. And so, that can be done on the mail list and hopefully in other event, uh, venues like the community meeting and other SIG meetings uh, as well. And lastly, uh, evolution. And this is really, uh, I've kind of talked about this a lot, but we need to get new leaders cultivated across the project. And part of the way that we want to do that is to have all of our sub-projects focus on the ability to cultivate new replacements for the people who are leaders in those sub-projects, our architecture sub-projects. And probably a lot of other SIGs as well. And uh, Tim St. Clair is hopefully gonna chime in uh, after this uh, presentation to talk about the ways that he did that in SIG cluster lifecycle. Um, but, so we really need to work with SIGs on engagement. Uh, I think our Windows kept work where we helped guide the Windows uh, folks in, in their work was really effective. We've done great work with Six Storage. We need to do a lot more of that. We also need to do things like put videos up and show how we do API reviews and code reviews so that as, as people want to become involved in this, they understand it's not an impossible thing. It's just something that may not be familiar with. And last, we really need to prioritize understaffed and unstaffed uh, architectural subprojects. Um, but we also need to do it in a way that minimizes toil. So, uh, part of it is identifying roles we need to fill. So doing, um, leveraging some of the great things that like SIG release has done. You know, Caleb Miles uh, was the originator of the shadow concept and that has been tremendously successful getting people ramped up. Um, and we can leverage a lot of known practices across the project that have been super successful. So what does this all mean? Um, practical steps is really just to look at our SIG charter and we have a to-do out there that has sort of been lingering about how we manage uh, tech leads at the, the SIG level and, and company diversity and whatnot. And this is really um, an opportunity for us to finalize the charter as it is and to say that a concentration of effort in centralized places is anathema to the, the, the risks that we face as a SIG. We also need to go through the process of moving CAPS to SIG PM. 
uh, so that uh, they can manage the process and we're really participants in that. And lastly, to just get steering review on the things that we're talking about here and just make sure that we, we check and, and, and say that these things are truly consistent with our governance. Um, like to move SIG meetings back to bi-weekly. They were started as bi-weekly and they went to weekly um, and didn't really net us any more efficiency. So as a way to sort of force ourselves into using the discussion uh, forums more uh, frequently, this is a way to do that. Um, and also this will allow us to um, have more focused reporting back from the subprojects. Um, and the subprojects should be using this uh, meeting as a venue to say help and have people actually volunteer and, and, and help do that because we need to staff these things really badly. Um, and so follow-ups, uh, Tim St. Clair has volunteered to, to help us um, talk about how to run federated subprojects more effectively as from his learnings in, um, in SIG cluster lifecycle. And uh, Paris is uh, kindly offering to help us uh, maybe look at the ways we might mentor uh, additional people. So those are really concrete steps. Yeah, and both of them are here now, so if we have time, we can also just go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, it would be great to, to have Q&A there. Um, last thing I want to share is this, this tweet, which was very timely, and, uh, and uh, it's really talking about Tim's experience with sort of rebooting um, how work was done in SIG cluster lifecycle. And actually, uh, Tim, if you're okay, can I turn the mic over to you for a second and let you just give a little bit of background on this, this tweet and sort of what, what your feelings are there? Yeah, it happened totally independently. Um, and it happened at, during the acquisition time of VMware. And I was, I was, I was surprised and taken aback by, you know, the work that was done by a lot of the other folks who were working on the sub projects. And one of the people on the call here is Lubomir. Uh, he, he had stepped up and done an awesome job as well as Fabrizio uh, on uh, the KubeADM side of the house. And I was being swapped with other meetings, but I no longer became the single point of failure. So I wanted to give a lot of credit to those two in particular, as well as all the other people in SIG Cluster Lifecycle for, for federating the projects and the responsibilities. Uh, so that way there was no one single point of failure in the system. And everything, people can go on vacation and they're not going to be, uh, you know, feel like they're totally left out of the loop or that the ball is going to be dropped. So I, the reason I sent out the tweet was because I've been inundated with uh, <laughs> post acquisition uh, communication to the point where I'm I'm effectively not effective uh, at doing some upstream work currently. But when I come back to it and I touch base with some of the people that we promoted with inside of the sub projects, uh, that I'm pleasantly happy to see that like. The ship's rolling and things are functioning very effectively. And David Watt is also here, so give him credit too as well because he's been helping out on cluster API work. Um, so I think that the building up and federating the work into responsible parties that have a unified vision of how execution can be done uh, makes it seamless. It makes it so that way you can you can come and go as needed. Uh, and be the arbiter at times when you need to, but don't feel like you have to have your hand in the pot for the entire cooking process. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Thank you so much. And, and it's just, this is sort of the reflective of the feeling, this, this sort of the right things happen at the right time. And uh, these conversations have been welling up in a lot of areas of the project. So it's nice to have sort of this coalescence uh, of people talking about this at the right time. So. With that, I really want to thank everybody for listening. Um, monologues are, are not fun uh, to listen to or to do, but uh, at the end, I hope that everybody in this meeting recognizes that I care tremendously and deeply and personally about this project and everybody's success. And I can say confidently that everybody I'm surrounded by right now feels the same. So we, we really care and we want to find a ways to, to make this work better and be better and help create a better work-life balance for everybody. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Um, I'd like Jordan to actually say something about what we're doing with the API review process. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we had actually written up um, a fairly detailed 
plan for how we would uh, be more transparent about the pipeline for API reviews and how things are getting prioritized, um, but then also uh, started thinking about uh, what Jace was talking about, training up like the next set of reviewers and approvers. Um, that plan sounded great and like so many things didn't actually get uh, staffed or executed on that much. Um, and so that is, that is something I've been working on for the past uh, few weeks. And uh, so there are a couple, uh, a couple aspects to that. Uh, the first is um, as we're thinking through processes and things like that, uh, really being careful not to be so aspirational that it uh, doesn't actually work. Um, like understanding how people are currently working uh, with issues and pull requests and like the workflows that we've been using for the past five years. Um, the more we can integrate with those and uh, kind of help people uh, and guide those, the better. So a couple of things that have happened just in the past couple of weeks, um, we have a label that anyone can add to a pull request that's ready for an API review that what makes it show up in a query so that we can have visibility to hear things that are asking for API reviews. Um, so just something super simple, lightweight, works with GitHub, works with all the label queries you can already do. Um, and then to make that discoverable, uh, we have things in, in the bot prow uh, tooling that will run queries and add comments to pull requests. And so as of today, actually, we have a bot that will look for things that look like they might need API reviews and add a comment and say, this looks like it might need an API review. Here's the, the documentation around like what things need review, what you should do before asking for one, um, getting input from the people who are responsible for this area of the code, and then here's how you ask for a review. Um, and so, I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, but uh, just really trying to meet people, contributors and reviewers and approvers where they're at and make their life easier. Um, as much as we can. So that's just kind of the, the process transparency side. On the, the mentoring side, um, we are, uh, for the 114 reviews, we're making an effort to uh, not just do reviews in isolation, but to, as much as possible, uh, bring in people who are interested, um, either from the SIG uh, or just from the community who want to uh, sort of hear the inner monologue of reviewers as they're looking at APIs and changes and, uh, and then capture some of that in uh, documents. So there's a, there's a tracking issue in the community repo where we're linking uh, notes that we're taking as we're doing these reviews. And the, the thought there is to turn those notes into uh, documentation. Uh, so the first step is kind of a capturing phase. Uh, and then the second step will be uh, documenting and, and coming up with kind of checklists types of things that will help people, people who want to do reviews, but also help people as they're making these changes um, so that they don't have to wait for weeks to get a reviewer to look at their pull request to tell them, oh, well, did you think about these three things that they could have just had in a list to, to look at ahead of time? So those are the two aspects we're working on right now. Thank you for doing that work, Jordan. Um, I did the original draft of the, the API review process and it went through <laughs> weeks and weeks of review. Uh, and what you came up with is so elegant and so well done. Thank you. It's fantastic. Super. Um, yeah, so no, we'll see once it, <laughs> and, and the thing is the, the more lightweight we are, the more adjustments we can make more easily if we get, you know, halfway through this release and we realize one aspect of this isn't working. Yeah. I, I want to second that and just say thanks. Um, making it reasonably approachable means that I can actually do it. And I actually felt really guilty when I did one review and I forgot to fill out the stream of consciousness doc along the way that I went back and I did it retroactively. Wow. Um, and I will say that I'm trying to be very intentional about doing my API reviews more so than I've ever done before. Previously, I just sort of treated them like another PR review. And now I'm trying to be a little bit more thoughtful, put aside time for it. Because uh, these API reviews sometimes are multi-hour reviews. Um, and um, working with a shadow has actually produced better reviews. Shocking, I know, to all you uh, uh, pure programming uh, <laughs> believers. Um, but it has produced better reviews, and I actually think that should be the standard process for API reviews. I think that every API review should be two people together in real time 
working through the issues, and if both of you can't figure out what's going on with something, then there's clearly something that needs work. Uh, so uh, just plus one, I've spent the last week uh, kind of three or four reviews using this very lightly modified process, and it's worked for me. Um, yeah, I just had one point for people who are, have not done API reviews and may not be aware of why do we need a bot? Are really so many changes happening? Uh, we did have a bot that would automatically flag PRs that touch the, the API directories with API change. There are about 120 PRs labeled with that. It's really hard to tell which ones are relevant, which ones are active, which ones are material API changes and things like that. Um, so that was not sufficient. And just a follow-up question for Jordan is, do you think you know, we're generating these stream of consciousness docs? Uh, would it, how hard would it be for someone to come in and help try to collate some of that information and document the conventions? But you just don't have to do it all. Yeah, I, I'm kind of waiting to see what kind of information we could gather. Um, we've got the API conventions doc, which is like a tome. Um, and so there would, def there would definitely be things to fold back into that, but I think what might be more helpful for people is um, kind of targeted, like what kind of, what kind of change are you doing? Here's, here's the short list of things to consider, like targeted checklist types of things. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of waiting to see what we, what we gather, uh, but uh, sharding some of that work out, there's a tracking issue in the community. I'll, I'll link these in the notes too. There's a tracking issue for the types of checklists I want to have. Um, and so uh, kind of assigning those out, if people are interested in um, helping develop one of those, that might be a, a good way to distribute some of that work. Okay. Harris, did you, I saw you post to the chat. Did you have some, something you want to say? Oh yeah, I'll, um, I can cover that on the next meeting from like a tactical perspective, but I just wanted to hit on the fact that videos are key here um, uh, for scaling uh, purposes. I mean, of course, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and things like that is still a good way to go, but from if we're, if we're looking to scale rapidly, videos are key. Uh, the two videos that I included in chat were from Contributor Summit. It was the API code review uh, that Daniel did and also the uh, code base tour uh, that Stefan did, uh, both got rave reviews from contributors, both uh, high, high mark sessions uh, during that time. So I feel like if you are currently an owner of something, you should get on a video and talk about that thing. And uh, like that's what I did with uh, networking. So I, I told yeah. Tim to do some tours of cube proxy and stuff like that. Um, this is how people learn. Um, people learn differently. Uh, so I have to stress that. So um, these are different ways and different approaches, and it's good that we are thinking about that. Yeah, so, so Ferris is, thank you. Ferris is going to come to the next meeting where she's going to share more about what contributor experience SIG has been talking about in the areas that are relevant to us, reducing toil through automation, mentoring, uh, defining roles that make it easier for people to understand what work needs to be done. And step up to those roles. Uh, so there's not quite enough time left today for both Q&A and for that discussion, so we pre-schedule that um, for the next time. But the general idea here is you know, we've been kind of barely treading water uh, in the SIG for a long time. Now we really need to focus on uh, sustainability and making sure that we use our time effectively. Uh, SIG Beer, your hand up. Um, so, I, to the value of inclusive over exclusive, uh, I generally agree with that, but I also feel like people often come to this particular forum because it's the only place where somebody has a binding no. Uh, you talked earlier in your slides about people providing feedback in the form of binding or non-binding plus ones but I personally am interested in how we can appropriately federate binding or non-binding minus ones. I, I feel like this project needs to avoid the anti-pattern of people shopping around for yes, uh, but I think it's also important that uh, we have more people than just Brian doing the thankless work of saying no when it is for the good of the project. Um, 
he's done it a lot and I'm super appreciative of it. Sometimes I'm a little frustrated by it, but I have come to understand the reasons why. And while I see that there's discussion about like documenting some of these things to maybe better help that, I'm coming from the perspective of establishing the level of trust and authority to lend credence to others to be able to say no. Uh, I'm especially concerned about this in the context of making sure we're having the right discussions at the right levels before immediately escalating to either SIG architecture or steering, where in both forums, at least certainly with my steering hat on, I guess I can't say much here in SIG architecture, but with my steering hat on, like if you haven't proven to me, you've taken the due diligence to try and sort this out amongst yourselves, why are you coming and talking to me? And I'm trying to understand what that process is going to look like uh, for SIG architecture. Um, but I think but my, my bigger point is just like, how can we spread out the, the, the ability of people to say no and have it stick? Yeah, so I, I want to clarify one thing first, which is, Tim, did you want to respond to that or did you have a separate question? There was a separate point, but I, can't, I also kind of wanted to respond to that. Um, I think the whole purpose of federating a group is you empower that subgroup. If there are approvers of that, that subgroup, that it's their responsibility. If you get a bunch of minus ones, the SIG's responsibility is to be the arbiter of last choice, right? This, this would be the venue for the minus one resolution if the subproject can't come to consensus. But if the subproject can come to consensus, that's totally in their dominion and they should have final say on those things, right? So I think empower, it's all about empowerment and federation. If you empower this group to make the choices, then that's their choices to make. It's their responsibility to give you feedback from time to time. But you know, I'm not going to go tell Justin Sarder Barbara how to write cops. But we are going to agree or disagree on some commonality for add-on management, right? And that that core piece that applies to everyone is where we 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 bubble it up to the top. Uh, so uh, I'll jump in. I think it's, it's handed off to me. Uh, this is actually where I look for the cap process to do a lot of that work. Um, as Jace noted so well, when we're in these meetings, it's not a great time to reflect and think about it and give feedback. And it doesn't really work for time zones and everyone's busy schedules. But if we get everything to go through a cap and then we review those caps, then that can be a place to, to, to say no or to say, uh, instead of just saying no, because yes, no gets into preferences, to say this doesn't work with the patterns of the project. This doesn't look work where we're going. Um, if this is gonna happen, maybe it's more appropriate else over here or here's a different way. And then we can collect those pieces of information and document them so then people can self-assess this for themselves. They can say, oh, this isn't the right pattern we should do it this way. You know, as we do more and more with CRDs, we can say in these cases, CRDs is the right example or operators are the right, you know, controllers are the right examples, things like this. And, and that kind of helps federate things while giving people time to review. Although right now, um, I, I think the one thing that Jay showed earlier was there aren't folks going after that whole cap thing, which is one of the things that I think in order to do this well, we'll have to do here in the short term. Uh, and, and so that's one of the things I'll probably go after to try to help um, just get the ball moving on that so we can build that constructive process around this uh, of guidance. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's great. Quentin, did you have something you want to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get back to your uh, point about us having a relatively small number of contributors uh, on a very large number of tasks. Um, and I had a thought, which I was curious if anyone else agrees or disagrees. I mean, it seems like what we're missing is, is a degree of project management here. I mean, I personally would be happy to try and contribute, but it's very difficult to find the list of things that need to be done. Um, and it's very difficult. And, and it's also, you know, sometimes useful to have someone chase you up and say, you know, you're a point person for this thing. Uh, could you please have it ready for presentation at the meeting next week or whatever? Um, I wonder to what extent that would, you know, help us to grow the group of people. And I know there's a there's a skill problem as well, which is, you know, not everybody has skills to do everything. But I think there's a project management function that can be useful here, uh, and and things like load balancing. You know, noticing that 
this is the list of things we have to do. And, you know, Brian signed up for all of them. Uh, can we do better? Can I go to Brian and say, can we take some of these things and give them to somebody else? Um, because sort of in the absence of that, and also in the absence of some official kind of baton handing over, it's very easy to end up trying to contribute to something and having it either shut down because somebody else is planning to do a better job or um, it's a duplicate of work that's being, you know, happening somewhere else. You're just not aware of it. Any of those potential problems. Whereas if you have a, I'll call them a project manager, um, making sure that we know what has to be done, who's doing it and make sure that the stuff gets done. I think that will go a long way towards addressing some of these things. Um, yeah. So I'll respond to that. Uh, I'm going to be going back to uh, probably being a chair in SIG PM um, precisely because uh, burnout is, is probably P0 and project management is probably P1 um, because those two are tightly coupled. And I would like to see us create much as, a, as we're talking about doing sustainable sub projects here. I would like to see project management also become a sustainable uh, part of the project. Um, and so, I have some ideas about that, and uh, I'm going to be trying to build some some momentum around the idea of a project manager role as being a first class contributor role, just like anything else. Um, so uh, that you're Quentin, you could not be more correct. That's a very astute observation. So we're we're definitely going to lean into that, and uh, and and just see what we can come up with there. Um, so yes, thank you. That's a really really good uh, observation. Do, do we see that as a as a function of the chairs of the SIG, or or do we not? Um, for me, no. I see that as chairs are really a partial contributor there, or maybe a stakeholder in the project management process. But it's a big role. Um, so yeah, I mean, Harris's suggestion was that we establish a project manager role, which might be useful. Yeah. Especially a scrum, at least a scrum lead someone that can at least come on and do a 15 minute stand up with active people who are currently like working on stuff and getting blockers and, and that's how contributors can pick up, can pick up work. Yeah. So if you're done, Jay, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, and then I think it's, um, Aaron and Dems yeah. and then, uh, Tim. Yeah, so I think one, one challenge with the chairs doing the project management is, they're doing too many things, so they're not able to like do work and do the project management and yes. et cetera, et cetera. Like we're just um, not even successfully treading water. In terms of focusing, uh, like I said, focusing on sustainability and effectiveness and efficiency of the SIG is kind of priority number one. Uh, in terms of our sub projects, and we have two sub projects that are really critical and are have some people working on them, obviously not enough people. Uh, so I suggest we just double down on those sub-projects first before trying to broaden to other things. So the API review and conformance are the two. Um, there is a conformance working group next week that I was gonna send out email about, but yeah, we need to figure out how to ramp more people up on these efforts and get project management under control for those two areas. Then we can think about expanding to you know other uh, architectural documentation and things like that, um, which is uh, honestly harder to fan out anyway. Um, so I think Aaron was next. Uh, yeah, Aaron then Tim. Um, and so yeah. on the project management front, the Stephen Augustus proposed having SIGPM offer their project management expertise to a couple of cross-cutting boards, including steering PM architecture when it comes to, comes to tracking caps or when it comes to tracking API reviews. Um, that may be helpful. I guess I personally believe that it is the responsibility of the chair to generally make sure that the SIG is effectively project managed. And if they can't do it themselves, then they should federate that out to a role. Um, and I, I thought like that's kind of what got Matt his chair seat in the first place. It's unclear to me whether or not he has still been effectively doing that or not. Um, so I would kind of, because to me, especially with this group, there's an awful lot of context that's kind of necessary to do the ruthless prioritization 
that Tim St. Clair is advocating for that, that worked so well for him. Um, another thought here is, I, I just wanted to say, I think Dems has been doing a great job of exemplifying some of the ideals I would look to for making this group productive, where he's just kind of showed up and pushed work forward, uh, only escalating when it comes time to make a decision. So I think of the little bits like, you know, K, K log and, and forking a YAML library uh, and starting to ask around about, do we really need Docker shim? Uh, do we really need this containerized flag? Things of that nature. Uh, I do feel like he's actually trying to push forward on making the sub projects move forward. Um, but what really needs to happen is more people need to show up and start doing the work. Uh, that way, that, I mean, that's how I trust people is to see that they actually say they're going to do the work and then they do the work and the work gets done uh, the, the way that we talked about. So in terms of getting people to show up, I back to the point of burnout, I feel like burnout often happens when there's a disconnect between an individual's values and an organization's values. Um, specifically in six different areas if you want to get theoretical about it it's workload control reward community and fairness um but in the context of this group and the people attending here like how do we make it valuable and worthwhile to incentivize individuals and their employers to do this work which is often perceived as kind of thankless and kind of boring like you mean i get to sit here and write a whole bunch of docs woo that sounds great but at the same time, we're saying writing down docs and clarifying case law is really the only way we do scale. Uh, so like, I don't have an answer to that question. I just feel like incentives need to be aligned. Um, whether that is us putting down some kind of big nope, sorry, big uh, nope in front of companies that just want to like have people show up and do work without actually doing some of the hard work necessary to scale the project or whether we try and find a way to make it valuable or rewarding to do this kind of work. I feel like we, need, we have to do something to make sure there is actually people willing to step up. Dems, uh, then Tim, then Matt. Hi, uh, thanks, Aaron. So um, uh, one thing that I'm seeing here, as well as in the uh, Kate's Infra group, is there are people who are interested in doing stuff, but then they don't know where to start. And from our side, the people who are talking in meetings like this is, we don't know who they are and what they're capable of. Um, so there is like a disconnect here. Unless we get to know the people and, and get, get to know a way and trust them, then we are not gonna be able to help them, you know, help mentor them, right? Uh, so I, I think going back to the uh, good first issue kind of uh, things that we said everybody has to do in KK, right? And other repositories. So can we define some some chunks of work that is bite-sized where we, we can let people lose and they can prove that, you know, they're capable of taking care of those kinds of things. And, you know, that is another thing that I think we need to start doing here. Uh, I wanted to talk about staffing the other sub projects, but then um, Brian already covered that. So that's all I had. Thanks, Tim's. Tim? Tim's made my segue easy. Um, the, and Aaron also knew what I was going to talk about. We, we are ruthless with prioritization uh, in SIG cluster lifecycle, uh, and we do continuous ongoing grooming in each of the sub projects, not all the sub projects, but some of the higher profile ones we do. And we've documented the, what we do and how to make it easier. Uh, and it helps for people who are new to the project to understand where to engage because we do have help wanted and good first issues. And as part of every single meeting, we actually go through and triage inbound. So because we have a unified set of practices that we do, and it's not, totally unified, it's very loose coupling, right? But, you know, David can speak to it. We've been doing it on Cluster API. Lubomir can speak to it. We've been doing it on Kubernetes. Uh, and it, it allows folks who are new contributors to, to get involved and engage. Because look at this call. There are 32 people on this call. That is crazy number of people for a single phone call. I'm sure their, their employers would allow them to engage if they knew exactly where and how and why. Thanks. 
could say um, for my next my, my yeah. next movie. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, you uh, you have a thing? Yeah. I was actually going to say, um, over in SIG apps, uh, we needed to do something with cron jobs. And so we put something up on the help wanted board, George pointed me to the right place. In the community meeting, we brought up, a, hey, this is a place you can contribute. And next thing you know, we had four or five people showing up. And what we had to figure out was, okay, we just had all these people showing up ready to go. What do we do with them? How do we help them on board? They were ready and raring to go and jump right in. Uh, we just weren't used to bringing people in. And so I think wherever we jump in and start with these things, if we think through how we can bring people on board and just kind of prepare for that initial onboarding, and then we go out and just start broadly asking, whether it's here or elsewhere, we'll be surprised at the, the people who might show up and start doing some of these things. And then we can help mentor them, show them what to do and where to go and get the ball rolling. So I'm gonna add in a, a denim to that. The best way to engage somebody in the community is to actually have a conversation. Um, a lot of, this is really true of a lot of underrepresented people as well, that they, they will not feel qualified to jump in and do anything unnecessarily because of imposter syndrome or a lot of culturation. But um, if you have a conversation with people who don't feel like they can do it and you tell them that they can and you believe them and you're willing to take that time and build that relationship, you will be amazed at the, uh, the way in which that can flourish and, and cause people to, to get involved. So every, if everybody, the 32 people on this call had one person in mind that they wanted to bring into this effort and help them get on board and do it, that would, that would immediately triple the amount of people we have working on things. So we, uh, you know, remember it's really conversations. We're a community. We, we are people that, you know, have lives outside of this and everything that's going on, but at the, the heart of it, we all care. So I think that, you know, touching people around you in your circle and having those discussions and explaining why this is so important can help elevate that work in their sphere as well. Yeah, maybe next time we should actually reserve some time for intros for some of the people yeah. that say, for people to introduce themselves, say who they are and why they're here. Yep. The intentions are good. Yeah, yeah. Um, any last questions before we, before we call it? Um, you have one, Chris? I just had a question. I just have a statement. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, I just want to reiterate one more time. People have different learning styles. I think the people that are on this call and all of our current contributors to date are here because clearly we all have a similar learning style and we flourish in ambiguous environments. And that's great for us. Uh, but the next wave of contributors and people that are going to help us might not learn in that fashion. And so that, that's why I think we need to take new approaches and those approaches we'll discuss in the next meeting. That's great. Um, last big thank you. Um, I know this is a lot. I know there's a lot of, well, I'm not huge changes, but there are changes uh, gonna come up as a result of this. So um, yeah, but thank you. And Dems, you have one last thing? Yes, from a practical point of view, what are we gonna change about the structure of the next meeting? Um, in two weeks, well, uh, we'll probably have a discussion on the mailing list about anything that's appropriate. but. Well, so we're actually have Paris book for next week, so we're okay. going to have a meeting next week. And okay, okay. Yeah. And I, want, I want to do a okay. discussion too. I'm not, okay. not going to do a lecture. We're going to I'll dig we'll dig deep into some what strategies can work for us and what doesn't. But, okay. Uh, to more completely answer the question, Dens, um, the next step slide kind of indicated the change in MO, uh, where we're going to take specific technical questions and direct them to the mailing list and have discussions there. And in these meetings, we're going to focus on the big organizational and scaling and sustainability effort. How do we, what is the work that needs to be done? How are we going to organize it? How are we going to bootstrap people? How are we going to do project management? Um, that needs to be the focus until that gets under control. And then we can, you know, once we're successful at that, we can broaden uh, to, you know, staffing the other sub-projects or, you know, the other, other issues that need to get solved. Thank you. Uh, are we canceling office hours? Uh, we, yeah, we don't have office hours. We did, and then it turned into a, just, just meet every week, and then, you know. yes. Yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. Uh, I don't think there was ever an intention for this group to meet every week to do these kind of things. It was to provide an office hours session. So if we're canceling that, that's fine. Then we 
Yeah, for now, I think we have to, because that was one of the things subtracting from time to actually yep. make forward progress on getting the safe to a healthy place. Um, Derek, you had your hand up. Can you make it really super quick? It is quick. So on the agenda, I'd seen that Dems had made note of the containerized cubelet discussion. Uh, I was not sure if, since I had already acted the PR to mark the behavior deprecated, if the reason it was raised here was there were concerns, but I feel like many of the same burnout issues that are being reflected here are also emblematic of why we would be looking to deprecate certain capabilities in SIGNODE. And so if, if there was not a real knack on it, I did not want to have to go and revert what I had already deprecated, nor did I know that anyone was going to be around to support something. Yeah, both of those done. topics that were raised seem like SIG node issues, so I don't see a need for SIG architecture to get involved. I do think it's a good idea to give people a heads up. There's an explicit disagreement from SIG cluster lifecycle, so this is one of those areas where two SIGs are disagreeing which one is right. Oh no, let's go to SIG arch because it crosses boundaries. Um, yeah. I was completely clear. Well, I was. We get asked continually, just so it's clear that because we get asked continually, what's the state of self-hosting? And we've, we've continually stated that it's an, it's an alpha grade state feature, uh, but we don't, uh, we don't make progress on any of this. So we'd have to make an official policy to say, you know, it's totally deprecated, we're not gonna do this. As long as we have a statement, I don't particularly care, as long as I can point to a decision in the statement, uh, that would be but fine with me. I separate self-hosting of the control plane from containerized cubelet. So um, the only statement I'm trying to make is that I don't think uh, history has proven that we can, in the Signo community, sustain more than one deployment topology of the cubelet. Right. I am going to treat it as an experiment that failed. Um, and both Signode and Sig Storage have indicated really strong preference for. I don't even want to say it's failed because yeah. I'm aware of users in the community yeah. who are using it successfully in production. I just don't think it's sustainable. Um, okay. okay. I stand corrected. So if there's any more clarification, it should move the mailing list because we've got to wrap up the meeting. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So everybody, please engage on the mailing list. That, that's what I was going to say. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a great week.